the pleasure of As we continue with our discussion towards the ICA November 2021 examination, we are looking at the issue about uh, evaluation of financial statements and looking at how we can uh, evaluate financial statements for an organization using the various ratios. And like I mentioned yesterday, this is a topic that is critical for those who are dealing with uh, management accounting, strategic case study, but most importantly, those who are looking at corporate reporting and financial reporting, because this is going to be basic and very important in that case. And we want to look at a part two of the discussion and look at the various things that we have to look out for in that case. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. Share the video. Let us reach as many students as possible watching the live stream. Most importantly, I want you to comment on the uh, chat uh, and then in the comment session, any questions you have for me, things that you would want me to share my thoughts on in that case. That you want me to share my thoughts on in that case. Jeremy G. Rose, I see you. You are welcome. Good evening. I hope you're doing well. Um, you said thanks for your F for the effort. Always a pleasure. And thank you for joining us on the live stream as we continue with our discussion. So yesterday we started with the issue about uh, evaluation of financial statement, and we spent some time to look at uh, the ROSI, that is the return on capital employed, and we made mention of the fact that it is the starting point for the profitability ratios, but we made mention of the fact that we're going to be looking at three categories of ratios generally. We're going to be looking at the statement of financial performance. We're going to look at the statement of financial position. We're going to be looking at the issues about the investors' ratios as well as we begin the discussion in that case. Um, I see some other comments coming in. Let's see if we can uh, pick them real quick and then continue. Shiman Kenno said, uh, good evening, Nishira. Good evening, Kano. Thank you for joining us. Kesi Kwekuban said, Chairman, ready for part two. Awesome. You are welcome. So give us a thumbs up on the video. Comment in the chat box. Any questions you have for us. But most importantly, also share the video. Let us reach as many students as possible watching the live stream. So we want to build it up on where we ended yesterday and want to look at the second profitability ratio that we're going to be dealing with and that is going to be the asset turnover ratio the asset turnover ratio now unlike the rosy which measures how much returns we make from the utilization of our assets the asset turnover measures how much revenue an entity generates from its assets okay so it measures the revenue generated from the utilization of assets. From the utilization of assets. In other words, when we have an asset of, say, $100 million, uh, how much revenue can we generate from that? Ideally, the higher this ratio, the better it is for the company. In other words, this ratio measures the efficiency and effectiveness of the entity's uh, assets within the organization. So the efficiency of the assets of the entity. So how efficient are our assets? So if we have assets as an organization, how efficient are the utilization of those assets? How much revenue that we are, gen are we generating from the asset? Like I mentioned, ideally, the higher this ratio, the better it is for the entity. The reason is that a higher asset turnover, a higher asset turnover, may indicate that the entity is generating more revenue from the utilization of an asset or from its asset. So it may indicate that 
the entity is generating more revenues from the assets or if you want capital employed but like i told you yesterday on uh the uh rosie now in case you missed yesterday's lecture you can check the description of this video because the part one is there or you can check the playlist single entity financial statements and you will see uh, interpretation of financial statement there and you can watch yesterday's lecture as well but then yesterday we made mention of the fact that ideally the rosy is supposed to be high and a higher rosy may indicate that the entity is doing as much as it is supposed to do or better still the entity is uh putting in place or well generating more profits from the utilization of its assets however we mentioned that the fact that a thing is high may not mean they are actually generating profits because sometimes when the capital employed figure reduces, the rosy is going to go up. The same thing happens to this asset turnover ratio. Even though a higher asset turnover ratio may indicate that, that is why we use the word may, indicates that the entity is generating more revenue from its capital that it has employed. Increasing the asset turnover may also be due to a fall in the capital employed for the year under consideration. Could also be a fall in the capital employed for the year under consideration. So how do we compute this at the end of the day? It's very simple. The asset turnover is going to be equal to the revenue divided by capital employed. The revenue divided by capital employed. Revenue divided by capital employed. Please know that with this one, our answer will be expressed in X times. Our answer will be expressed in X times for that particular one. So that is the concept about asset turnover. So whilst Rosie is looking at how much profit we are making from the utilization of our assets, the asset turnover is asking how much revenue are we generating. Now, ideally, like we mentioned, these two ratios are supposed to be going up. If they are going up, it may be an indication that the entity is doing well. But again, the fact that they are going up may not mean that the entity is doing as much as it is supposed to do in that case. So that is the second profitability ratios, and I'm going to be coming back to that in a moment third one is the gross profit margin the gross profit margin ratio the gross profit margin ratio now the gross profit margin ratio simply measures the returns that the entity is making from its sales for the period under consideration the returns that the entity is making from the sales for the period under consideration. For its sales for the period under consideration. So it measures the returns an entity makes from sales after lessing or after deducting cost of sales. So that is the gross profit margin. Again, a higher gross profit margin is preferable for the entity in that case. But then, an increase in the gross profit margin uh, may indicate that, so an increase in gross profit margin, GPM, may indicate that
may indicate that one variable cost and then other raw other cost like raw material cost maybe labor cost among others are not rising as quickly as the selling price okay are not rising are not rising as quickly as the selling price so when the uh, gross profit margin is going up it's telling us that okay probably the cost of sales the now when we look at the cost of sales they, they are going to be mostly variable costs coming in uh, generally. And this variable cost could be raw material cost, could be labor cost, meaning that they are not rising as much as the entity's uh, selling price are rising. That is why the gross profit margin is increasing for the period under consideration. For the period under consideration. However, there are times when this gross profit margin may be going up or may be coming down. It could mean because the entity has maybe introduce a uh, new product. It could be because of introduction of a new product. Maybe the gross profit margin may also be going up because of the fact that the entity has reduced prices. So remember that from the uh, principles of economics, demand when the prices of goods go down all other things being equal the quantity demanded was goes up so maybe the reason why the gross profit margin is coming down is either we have introduced a new product or we have reduced selling prices so we have sold more so revenue is going up at the end of the day as an organization in that case so when you talk about the gross profit margin this is what we are saying when you take your revenue and you deduct your cost of sales, how much returns are you making? Preferably, the higher the return, the better it is for the organization. The higher the returns, the better it is for the organization. So we say that a gross profit margin is going to be equal to the gross profit divided by the revenue times 100%. Or times 100 because our answer will be in x percent gross profit divided by revenue times 100 gross profit divided by revenue times 100 that is very important very basic in that case now i'm going to be coming back to this as well let's look at the last one and that is going to be the net profit margin now immediately we are talking about net profit we are talking about after we are taking we take into consideration what op all operating what expenses so it measures the returns an entity makes the returns an entity makes it measures the returns an entity makes from It measures the returns an entity makes from uh, the revenue after deducting all expenses, including including operating expenses including operating expenses. So stay with me carefully here. If we take out all the operating expenses from our cost, how much returns are we making? Remember, the higher this ratio also, the better it is for the company. The higher the ratio, the better it is for the company as well at the end of the day. And like I said, I'm going to be expanding on this also in a moment. Stay with me as we move ahead. So mathematically, we say that this is going to be equal to the profit before interest and tax divided by revenue, okay, 
times 100. So our answer is going to be X percent at the end of the day. X percent at the end of the day. So these are the four ratios that we are going to be using when assessing the profitability of the organization or when assessing the financial performance of the organization. Now, I see some of you guys coming up. You are welcome to the stream. This is part two of our discussion on uh, interpretation of financial statement. Please note that this is a done deal topic for financial reporting students, done deal topic for corporate reporting students, and partly done deal for management accounting students as well as for strategic case study students. So you want to make sure you understand this very well. And it is not about your ability to calculate, but it's about your ability to interpret. And that is what I'm getting into. So make sure that you stay with me carefully. Give me a thumbs up on the video when you join. Share the video. Let us reach as many students as possible. And we want to get a lot of people watching this live stream. But most importantly, comment in the chat box, comment in the comment section, any questions that you have for me at the end of the day. So the question we then ask ourselves is, how do we interpret the profitability ratios? So in order to interpret the profitability ratios, I'm going to give you the guidelines for the interpretation of the profitability ratios. So stay with me because I'm going to illustrate how you, what am I spelling? Guidelines. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so let's go. Uh, I'm spelling some things that I, I don't even know. So guidelines or principles for the interpretation. You ready? Principles. So if the examiner says, interpret the following ratios, how are you going to go about it? How are you going to go about it? That is what I want to give you. Now, for those of you especially writing corporate reporting, sometimes the examiner could be excited about it and we say, write a report. Or the examiner could be excited and we say, um, write to the shareholders. Or the examiner could just say, interpret the financial statement of the financial statement. So let's assume we are writing a report. And we are supposed to assess the financial performance and financial position of the organization. How do we go about it? Stay with me because this is where the marks are going to be in that particular case. I see some comments coming in. Let me bring them up real quick and let's continue. Uh, Abdullah said, thanks for this session. You are truly a man of impact. I have been following your classes on YouTube. That's awesome. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words. Um, Nashi Rudaki said, good evening, Nishira. You are doing a great, a good job. Keep it up. Thank you, uh, Nashi Rudaki. Uh, um, then Abdullah came and said, I'm currently writing final level of ICANN Nigeria. That is great. I hope that you are attending lectures because that is very critical there. Augustine A. Barton said, hello. Hi, Augustine. Hope you're doing well. Jeremy Giro said, ICA sent... A shout out to you today on the student encounter. I was like, yeah, that's my lecturer. Oh, okay, that's great to hear, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Kumado said, good stuff. Thank you, Peter. Then uh, Ansumana Danso said, I have been... I have done this on ACCA Foundation, but now I am understanding it deeply. Wow, that is awesome, Dan. So uh, that is the objective for the live stream. For those of you who are just joining, comment in the chat box any questions you have for me. Most importantly, what topic would you want us to discuss on the live stream? Uh, so comment in the chat box. We have a number of topics coming up, but just bring your own up, and then let's see how we go about it. Stan Obi said, hi. Been a long time I saw your live lectures. Wow, we, we, we were live on Monday, we were live yesterday, and we are live today also, so we're back. So make sure you connect every day, every weekday, 4.30 p.m. to um, 4.30 p.m. as we continue with our discussion. Then uh, another comment is coming from Ariyu, said, hello, nice to be here again. Hi, Inshira, quite an... Age okay, I don't understand the quite an age. Are you saying it's been a long time since you heard from us or what? <laughs> so let's go. Let me bring up my screen back and let's go. Now, this is the part of the lecture I wanted to be serious about, so make sure you stay with me carefully here as I drop this up. So let's say we are writing a report on the 
evaluation of financial statement okay so if you are writing a report then definitely we need to have our to our from okay we got to have our dates coming up and we're going to have our heading here what is it about generally so the to is the people to whom the report is being written the from is you, the one writing it. The date will be the date on which you are writing the report. Then you bring the heading, analysis of financial statement. After that, there has to be an introduction. So we have our introductory paragraph here. Now, what you want to do in the introduction is to tell us what this uh, report is actually about. So you could say that this, just, just, a, just an example, okay? This is an evaluation okay of the financial performance and financial position of maybe the name of the company will come NP limited right uh, for the year ended whatever 31st October 20x2 using the profitability, liquidity, and gearing ratios. Okay? So, something like this. Clean. Okay, so your intro has to be clean, sweet, straight, to the point right now this is very critical if you screw up the introduction you're going to screw up everything so you got to make sure you you just keep the introduction what you want to do in the introduction is to go straight to the point what the heck is this report about and then uh what are you doing in the report and then what ratios are you looking at at the end of the day so that is our intro so once we present our intro then we will take the ratios of one after the other profitability ratios then you talk about it from there you come to the liquidity ratios then you talk about it for some reason my pro forma is not going here uh let me take it to the next page don't worry i'm just gonna cut it and send it to the next page let's see cut right let's take it to the next page okay this is better let me zoom it out a little bit then we bring in the gearing ratio so these are all paragraphs okay then after that most importantly conclusion many a time when writing evaluation of financial statements and writing the analysis students don't bring conclusion so your intro is very important your heading is very important then you pick the uh each, each paragraph will address the things now you will realize that i didn't write here return on capital employed uh return on uh net profit margin gearing ratio that uh, uh your friend is saying liquidity ratios you realize uh, you realize that i am not listing the individual ratios but i'm bringing the broad heading the reason why you bring the broad, broad heading is that like i told you yesterday the ratios must be studied and must be interpreted together so when you are interpreting the profitability ratios they must go hand in hand in that case and i'll come back to that in a moment so if for instance we are writing a report to evaluate the financial statement of the organization then certainly um the heading must come the introduction must come profitability must be there liquidity must be there gearing must be there and then what your conclusion comes at the end of the day so that is the pro forma of how your analysis is going to be done now if it is not a report you are writing to anybody then you can just start with your heading your introduction then each of the ratios take a paragraph and most importantly your conclusion coming there in that case your conclusion coming there in that case so these are the things that you need to understand so now that you understand the general uh presentation of the uh analysis let's go back to the guidelines i spoke to you about on interpreting the ratios number one is that you need to briefly define the ratio 
Not all the time, but sometimes you can briefly define the ratio. Just briefly. Remember the language there is briefly define the ratio. Number two, you tell us uh, what you are going to be doing at the end of the day. In other words, the percentage change. Okay. Number three, you need to talk about the possible reasons for the change. Number four, the implications of this on the operations of the business. And then number five, you can make some recommendation. Now, stay with me carefully here. Usually, the implication and the recommendation will be done in the conclusion paragraph. Okay? In the conclusion paragraph, you can talk about the implication. Because if you say every ratio, you talk about the implication, every ratio you make recommendation, we don't have a lot of time for that. We don't have a lot of time for that. So you briefly define what the ratio is. Tell us the, the percentage change in the ratio. Most importantly, most importantly, in all of these things is the second and the third one. The percentage change and then what? The possible reasons. What we see a lot of students do is that, and what I see students do uh, from my experience over the years, is that students are going to be saying that, like I told you yesterday, so for instance, we have 20x5, 20x6. Now, let's bring up some of the ratios. Let's say that Rosie is, uh, we cannot be excited too much, 15% and then 25% is coming up. Asset turnover, let's say it is uh, 15 times. As compared to 12 times here. And then let's say that the net profit margin, it's also going to be something like maybe uh, 25% and then uh, 22% or let's say 30%. So if we have these ratios and we are interpreting these ratios, now, some students will just get up and say, eh, the Rosie has gone up from 25%, from 12, 15% to 25%. And so what? And so what? That is not what we want you to do. That's not what you're supposed to do. So you don't just say, eh, the thing has gone up by this percentage. And so what? What are the possible reasons for the change? What are the possible reasons for the change? Very, very important. Very important. Now, the possible reasons for some of the changes are below. Now, sometimes they can be in the question and you can pick it up. Other times you may have to assume and use them in your interpretation. So what are some of the possible reasons? One, it could be because of changes in revenue. So maybe revenue has gone up or has come down, profitability ratios coming in. Two, it could be because of changes in pricing policies of the organization. Three, it could be because of changes in credit policy of the organization. Now, remember I told you that the standards don't work alone. So stay with me because I'm going to drop some issues with you uh, in that particular case as we go ahead with this. Four, it could be because of changes in uh, cost of sales. Number five, it could be because of changes in operating costs. So when we talk about the possible reasons for the movement in the ratios, especially the profitability ratios, it could be because the revenue is changing. It could be because the pricing policy of the company has changed from the last year to this year. It could be because of the credit policy of the company changing. It could be because of the cost of sales has changed. Or it could be because the operating expenses, uh, operating cost of the organization has changed. Now, how do we contextualize this? Stay with me carefully here. So let's say that this is the ratio the examiner has given me. Hypothetically, and I'm supposed to interpret this ratio here. I'm supposed to interpret this ratio here. 
So how do we go about it? Now, because it is profitability ratios together, I, I, I need to look at them in not individually. Because if you look at them individually, you will make a mistake. Let me show you what I mean by that. Look at the rosy. The rosy is going up. Okay? Stay with me carefully here. And then look at the asset turnover. The asset turnover is coming down. Look at the net profit margin. It's also going up. Now, I want you to stay with me very carefully here. So if you are looking at these ratios individually, then you will say that, okay, the reason why the rosy is going up is because the entity has sold more during the period under consideration. Or the entity has controlled its operating expenses or cost of sales more. That is why the rosy and the asset turnover is going up. Now, if you say that the rosy is going up, the net profit margin is going up because the entity's revenue has gone up or the entity is selling more, you may be lying. Why is that? Because you realize that the asset turnover which measures how much revenue an entity generates from the utilization of assets, is falling. So it tells you that the entity is generating less revenue than it generated from the previous accounting year. What does that tell you? It tells you that the entity is not utilizing its assets efficiently, or better still, it could mean that the entity has... Uh, a put some assets somewhere that they are not utilizing at the end of the day. For that reason, the sales is not going up in the current period that it is expected to go up. However, if rosy and the net profit margin are rising, this could mean that the entity is controlling its operating costs much better than uh, it controlled in the previous accounting year in that case. So that is what you need to understand when we talk about the issue in relation to the interpretation of these ratios. So you realize that looking at the ratios in isolation, you may be making a lot of uh, mistakes, but looking at the ratios together, you will be able to make uh, a, a better analysis of the decision at the end of the day.
right so that is the issue about how we interpret these ratios so do, do you see how we are doing the interpretation so you don't just get up and say oh the ratio is rising because of this because of that no you need to look at the ratios together otherwise you will say something in interpretation of one ratio then you contradict yourself in another ratio with a wrong statement. That is why I say that the ratios must be looked at holistically. The ratios must be looked at holistically in that case. Not looking at it one after the other, but looking at it as a whole in that case. Let me know. Is everybody okay with that? Does it make sense for you? Do you understand how the interpretation is supposed to be done now? Because this is just uh, an intro. What I do is I don't give students uh, the way they should interpret it, but I give you the blueprints of how you should do the interpretation because you must know how to go about it by yourself so that you'll be able to write out your English in that case. I see some comments coming in. Let me see if I can pick them up. Let me know if the interpretation is great for you. You understand it very well. Let's see how it goes in that case. Uh, Raymond Adonko said, you are simply good. Keep the generosity up. You will surely always meet with generosity all the days of your life. Thank you, Raymond. Um, Lamy said, keep inspiring us, sir. The good Lord, the good God shall bless you abundantly. I have been patiently waiting for this lecture. Wow, that's awesome to hear. Now you got it. Raymond said, Please, when will you be doing advanced taxation, corporate income tax, financial gain, and financial cost? Like I said, uh, what to the topics you want us to cover, put it in the chat because we will be having a session on it, and then we will help you to answer some of the questions you are having in that case. Augustine said, at what step does the brief explanation come? Is it after the computation of the ratio or prior to the computation? No. You are doing interpretation. So it is in the interpretation that you are giving us a brief explanation of the ratio that you are actually interpreting. So it is not prior or after. It is when you are doing the interpretation. Uh, Chinon So Emmanuel said, I am following from Nigeria. Nice one, sir. Awesome, Chinon So. Uh, Stan Obi said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. That is awesome to hear. Daina uh, Hopa said, Sir, please go over the interpretation again. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Let's see. So this is what we are saying. This is what we are saying. Uh, where is my pen? So this is what we are saying about the interpretation. So if you look at the scenario we have here, if you look closely at the scenario we have here, we have the rosy, uh, we have the asset turnover, we have the net profit margin. Now, looking at the ratios carefully, you realize that the rosy is going up. The net profit margin is going up, but the asset turnover is falling. So if you are doing the interpretation, you say, oh, the rosy is rising. This could be because the entity's revenue has increased during the period under consideration. You, are, you may be lying. Why is that? Because the asset turnover, which measures the revenue generation capacity of the entity's asset, is falling. So it tells you that the reason why the rosy is going up may not necessarily be because of revenue rising, because revenue is actually falling as compared to the previous year. For that reason, the best way we can put this is that the reason why the rosy is rising could be because the entity is controlling its costs in the current year, 20x, much better than it was controlling in the previous year. When we say its cost here, we are looking at the uh, operating cost as well as the cost of sales in that case. So that is how we would go with this interpretation. So you realize that once we are doing the interpretation, we are doing the three in one. You got to be careful because if you say you do the interpretation for them individually, like I said, you may be contradicting yourself. So you must understand how the three ratios connect with each other and how 
you can affect the ratios in that case. So that uh, Dina, let me know if that makes sense for you in that particular case. Let me know if that makes sense for you. Now, when an asset turnover is falling, it may not necessarily be because the entity is not utilizing its assets properly. Because you see, when interpreting the asset turnover, there are a number of issues that we may have to take into consideration as an organization in that case. The first thing has to do with maybe timing of sales. Okay, timing of sales. Probably uh, the period that the entity is in, or maybe in the current year or in the previous year, the timings are different. Like, for instance, if you're dealing with a pandemic or da 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 da, then it means that even though the assets are there, we are not utilizing them. It, so it may not be because of the entity not really utilizing the assets the way they are supposed to utilize it. But then that is the idea. Then the next thing has to do with the asset efficiency at the end of the day. Now, you see, one thing you must understand is that as a company's assets ages, their efficiency falls. So it could mean that the entity is still having the same asset it was having last year, but the reason why the asset turnover is falling is that now those asset efficiency has what? Reduced. And then it could mean that the entity has fairly the same asset uh, from last year to this year, but then the asset turnover may be increasing, meaning that the assets are being effectively what? Or efficiently utilized. So sometimes the asset turnover could not just be because the entity is lazy, the entity is not putting the assets to use, but it could be because of the timing of sales. It could be because of the efficiency of the assets under consideration at the end of the day. And sometimes it could even be the valuation policies of the entity, the valuation policies of the entity. So you realize that there are a number of factors that actually goes into the whole picture of interpretation of the ratios. And if you don't take into consideration the whole picture and you just look at some shallow, shallow understanding, then you end up getting zero or getting a mark that you are not supposed to get at the end of the day. That is generally how we're going to be interpreting the financial statements when it comes to the ratios uh, on uh, the financial performance. Now, note, there is a connection that the asset turnover has with the trade payable, the trade receivable days. Let me explain that to you. Let's say that, for instance, in the ratio presented to us, the asset turnover is going up. Okay? And then the trade receivable days is also going up. Stay with me carefully here. So when you look at the asset turnover, it's increasing. The trade receivable days is also increasing. Now, trade receivable days measures how long it takes an entity to what? Uh, collect the cash from credit customers. So if the trade receivable days is going up, it tells us that the reason why the asset turnover is rising as well is because of the fact that the entity may be selling more. But the reason why the entity may be selling more is that Probably it has introduced favorable credit policies, or better still, it has done a lot of sales on credit. It is for that reason why the trade receivable days is what? Going up. So look at the connection. And, and this is the level of understanding that the examiner wants to be excited about when you are presenting your ratios, where you are able to draw the connection that exists between the individual standards and not just talking about the standards in isolation like you are in KG2. No. you got to be serious about it. So you realize that the asset turnover has a relationship with the trade receivable days. So if the trade receivable days is falling and the asset turnover is rising, then it could tell you that even though the entity may be selling more, or it, it could suggest that the entity may be selling more in cash rather than on credit uh, at the end of the day. Or like I said, it could be because the entity has disposed of some assets during the year or repaid some loan note during the year. So their capital for the period actually reduces. But then comparatively to the revenue, it's coming up at the end of the day. And that is the connection that you draw about the interpretation of the financial statement. Any questions, please? Let me know. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? 
Then we come to the statement of financial position. Financial position. So in the financial position, there are about three broad ratios that we're going to be calculating, or two broad ratios, depending on where we are standing at. The first one is going to be the liquidity ratios. Then there is going to be the working capital ratios. Let's start with the liquidity ratios. Now, the liquidity ratio simply measures the entity's ability to pay short-term debt as and when they fall due. An entity's ability to pay short-term debt as and when they fall due. That is the liquidity at the end of the day. The liquidity at the end of the day. Now, when measuring the liquidity of a, of a company, there are a number of things that comes to being that we need to take into consideration and look at that at the end of the day in that case. Because remember, the liquidity and the working capital ratio gives us an idea about the working capital management techniques of the entity. Because remember, if an entity poorly manages its working capital, it affects its liquidity. If the entity has a, buys a lot of credits and uh, its cash uh, deficit, then the liquidity ratio is going to actually worsen at the end of the day. If the entity also sells a lot on credit, then it is likely to incur a lot in bad debt. If the entity has a lot of inventory in stocks, in store, then the entity may not be managing its inventory as well. So you realize that the individual components of working capital, when we are looking at the statement of financial position, firstly, or first part of it is to analyze this particular aspect of it. So when it comes to the liquidity ratio, we have what is called the current ratio. And this is simply the ratio of the current assets divided by the current liabilities. So if we take the current asset that a company has and compare it with the current liability, what exactly are we supposed to have at the end of the day? Usually what happens is that the current ratio should be greater than one. Ideally, it should be above 1.5. Okay, it should be greater than one. Ideally, it should be above 1.5. If it is 1.5, it tells us that, oh, in the short term, the entity will be able to pay its debt as and when they fall due from the current assets. But you see, the current ratio doesn't give us a, a great picture when it comes to dealing with really the liquidity position of the company. Why? Because this current asset you see here actually includes inventory. The current asset actually includes inventory. So the ratio that provides us with a better understanding of the liquidity position of the organization is what is called the quick ratio. Another name for that is the acid test ratio. The way this works is that we're going to take the current ratio and we deduct the inventory that the entity has divided by the current liabilities. Sorry, we take the current assets, not the current ratio. Current assets minus the inventory divided by current liabilities. Now, how is that? Stay with me carefully here. Why is the inventory taken out? Because you see, in the short term, it is difficult to what? sell inventories. In the short term, it is difficult to convert inventory into cash. So the quick ratio tries to measure the most liquid assets of the entity. Okay? The most liquid assets of the entity. In other words, which assets can quickly be converted into cash as compared to the amount we owe in the short term at the end of the day. So again, when this ratio is going up, it is an indication that the entity is managing its liquidity position very well. But if it is falling, it is an indication that the entity is not managing its working capital well. But you must stay with me carefully here because even though we have stated that the ratio should be greater than one, uh, in that case, if it is falling, you don't just say, oh, it is still good. So let's say that you have 20x5, 20x6. And let's say that you have the quick ratio coming in. 
quick ratio coming in. And let's say that a quick ratio coming in, it's let's say um, 1.3 here, okay? And then let's say it was 1.9 here. Now, it is falling. Sorry, uh, I don't want to do this. Let's do 1.9 here and 1.3 here. So you realize that if you compare 20x5 to 20x6, the liquidity ratio is falling. Now, even though it's falling, it is still greater than 1. Now, if you just say, oh, even though it is falling, it is still greater than 1, it means the company has no liquidity problem, you may be lying. Why is that? Because if just within one year, the uh, quick ratio is falling by 0.6%, it means that if the entity doesn't put in place measures to uh, control its working capital well, in 20x7, they are likely to have 0. Point something quick ratio, which could mean that in future, they will be having liquidity problems. So even though you can say that right now in the next six months, they may not be having liquidity problem because it is 1.3, the actual implication is that the margin of the fall is big for that reason, could affect the future liquidity of the organization. So even though the liquidity ratio may be falling, but it is still greater than one, we don't just conclude and say the entity is out of the woods or the entity is not going to have troubles. Once it is falling, we have to uh, recommend to the entity to manage its working capital very well to avoid any future liquidity problems at the end of the day because if you are not if you cannot pay your short-term debt as and when they fold you then that is going to also have an impact on the jerry ratio at the end of the day so that is how we deal with the current ratio and also the quick ratio the current ratio and also the quick ratio any questions so far any questions so far and le let me uh, i see some comments coming in let me see if i can Bring them up uh, real quick. Shema Kanmo said, Inshira, during an exam, sometimes the examiner asks you to compare three or four periods and considering the time limit, how can do this quickly to be on time in comparing the question? If the examiner asks you three or four years, yes, you have to compare them and state the possible reasons why you're supposed to go that. Uh, traditionally, it's supposed to be two years. But if it is three or four years, which means you have a lot of marks than the standard 10 marks or 11 marks that you may be having. So if there is a lot of marks coming in because it is three years, because if it is three or four years, then it will be a huge mark. So if it is a bigger mark than the normal 10 or 11 marks that you would have had if you are doing only two years or compare it with... Uh, Comparing the company with an industry average, if it is four, that means the marks will be huge. In which case, you just have to plan the way you uh, look at your analysis using the same principle that we have established. And over the years, uh, look at what is going on. So that maybe from one year to another, it is increasing. Then from one year to another, it is reducing in that order. Then you can explain or state the reasons why some of these things are actually occurring or taking place in that case. Eric Boabain said, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, Eric. I hope that you're doing well. Fred Johnson said, good evening. Good evening, Fred. I hope that you're doing well uh, in that case. Let me know any other questions uh, for me quickly as well. Isaac Idioba, Samuel Corte, and then Amina Amasam. Thank you for the thumbs up on uh, the like on YouTube. Uh, sorry, Facebook. Uh, in that case, and YouTube, we see some thumbs up coming up as well. Thank you guys for uh, the thumbs up. So that is the idea about how we deal with the liquidity ratios. Finally, about the statement of financial position is the working capital ratios. Now, this is where we're going to be dealing with some slippery flaws. <laughs> basically at the end of the day so working capital ratios working capital ratios working capital ratios so when it comes to the working capital ratios here yeah, there are a number of ratios that are going to be coming to being that we need to calculate 
like the inventory days, trade receivable days, payable days, uh, those kind of things is what we're going to be talking about generally when it comes to dealing with the issue about that particular one. So working capital ratios. Now, these ratios are there. Unlike the liquidity ratios, which measures the entity's ability to pay its short-term debt, like I mentioned, the working capital ratios, the liquidity ratios also inform us about the entity's ability to manage its working capital well. Because a worsening liquidity indicates that the entity is not managing its capital or its working capital well. And then when the liquidity position is improving, then it tells us that the entity may be managing its working capital well. There is a question from Stan Obi says, when comparing a company's year with another company's same year or industry average, will it be the same interpretation? The context is going to be different because if you are comparing uh, an industry average to uh, a company's uh, result, so you are comparing, say, uh, company A with industry average. So what's going to be happening is that you will be saying that, okay, the company's rosy is higher than the industry average. This means that the company is either generating more revenue than the industry average, which will be confirmed by the asset turnover. So you realize that, if you understand the concept well, you realize that you will be able to uh, chip in the uh, other ratios organically. So for instance, maybe Rosie is going up and asset turnover is also going up. So what you will say is that companies A, Rosie is higher than the industry average. This could mean that uh, the company A is controlling its cost much better than the industry average and also generating more revenue than the industry average as indicated in the asset turnover of the entity, which is also higher than the industry average. Do, do you see that? Do you see that? So when you are comparing the entity to another entity or to industry average, you're not going to talk about a change. You're going to talk about whether this is higher, this is lower, and why you think, based on the deeper understanding that you have on the uh, ratios that you are presented with, how those ratios are going to be subject to change at the end of the day. And that is what you need to understand about what you do when you are comparing a company with another company or an industry average. So in principle, you're going to be talking about the same things, only that you are going to be careful about your choices of words. So unlike, oh, it is rising, it is reducing, because you are comparing two companies, you will say this is higher than this, this is lower than this, and it could be because of the company does this and the industry doesn't do this or that other company doesn't do this in that case. So Stan Obi, that is how we do the interpretation for that. That is how we do the interpretation for that. So working capital ratios, working capital ratios. Now, because of time constraints, I'm going to conclude around here today. And God willing, tomorrow we will look at the final part of this discussion, go through the working capital ratios and discuss uh, the gearing ratios uh, quickly. And then uh, that will be all for uh, this particular topic. And then we will look at a question about the ratios a bit later on. Like I, say, like I said, even if I solve a question in ratios with you, I won't write any interpretation for you. The reason is that, and I don't do that for the past uh, 80 years that I've been teaching, uh, close to 80 years that I've been teaching this subject, corporate reporting, financial reporting, and all that. <laughs> I don't write ratios out. So what I'm going to do is that we could practice a question, and I'm gonna, uh, we could do that maybe on the Zoom call, then once we solve the question together, we do the calculations together, I give you the uh, general explanation on how the ratio is going to be like, then you write your own English. Now, the reason why I do that is that based on your understanding, you write your English. Then you send it up. Then we polish it. Then you set it up. Then we polish it. And that is what I do with my students, especially when it comes to dealing with the ratios. Because you see, if I sit down and write a ratio for you, you may copy that same thing 
and go to the exam hall with it. But if I give you the general principle on how the interpretation is supposed to be, if you see A, B, and C, the kind of words you are supposed to use, you, then you put them in your own terms, boom, guess what? You will become successful at the end of the day. So that is what you need to understand. I'm going to conclude around here today. God willing, tomorrow we're going to be uh, continuing with it. We'll do the final part tomorrow on ratios. Then possibly on Friday we will take uh, some other topic as well as uh, we have a lot of topics that have been sent to us in this discussion in that case. So thank you very much for joining the stream. It's always a pleasure coming your way. Stan Obi said, uh, noted. Okay, so you understand that uh, in that case. Nayan Gupta said, uh, how to tackle scenario-based questions in a time span of 45 minutes of 25 minutes questions of AFM. Uh, I don't know. I don't get a context of your question, but maybe if you can give me good context. Uh, Ario said, please, can we solve question on ratio on YouTube? Like I said, I could bring up a question, we will calculate, but I will not write the interpretation for you. So, if anything, we would uh, arrange that session on a Zoom, not on YouTube, so that, like, you finish writing, you send it up, I look at, correct, da 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 da, da. So, we will see if uh, that could be possible for us to hold and uh, how we can go hold that up. Because when it comes to ratios, I don't write for. I wouldn't want to write to you the interpretation, then you copy it and put it down. I mean, to me, that is... That is, that is not good. I mean, that, 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 that doesn't make you think uh, well for yourself as an individual. But if you understand the general principle, you write your own English, send it up to me, then I tell you, okay, you're supposed to put this here. You're supposed to put this here. This language is very wrong. The grammar here is a problem. Is a problem. The explanation you did here contradicts with what you say here. Then we solve it. Then, so that is how you can better be prepared for the exams and not me writing the interpretation down for you then you copy it and memorize it and nah, 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 nah. to me that is laziness so i ain't gonna do that but we could solve a question and that will be live on zoom and then we can see how we will go about that sandra hey i said sandra <laughs> sandra is gonna kill me sandra kluche said god bless you shira god bless you too, sandra for joining us dina hopper said Thank you for today. Always a pleasure, Diana. Thanks for joining us. Francisca Kujo on Facebook said, please, I would like to get some insight on IFRS 15 and IAS 9 financial instruments. I don't know what you mean by insight you want to have, but uh, if you ask a specific question, I could look at that uh, for you possibly tomorrow on the live stream. Nayan Gupta said, ACCA AFM question of 25 marker, ACCA question. How to tackle scenario-based question in a time of 45 minutes? I can't be able to understand scenario fully, so I can't perform well. How? Okay. Uh, join on the live stream tomorrow early. And uh, early tomorrow, I'll do some Q&A before uh, we finish with the ratio. So uh, bring this up as well tomorrow, and I'll look at it because I'm uh, backed in time that I cannot look at it anymore. Eric Barbain said, thanks. Uh, Obi said, thanks a lot. Always a pleasure. So thank you very much. For those of you who shared the video, God bless you. It's really something that we uh, look for. It's something that helps us a lot. Because the more you share the video, the more you engage with the video, the more people look at the video, the more we are able to assist a lot of students. Remember, like what I'm teaching here on the ratios is a done deal for financial reporting. It's a done deal for corporate reporting. So if I'm going into the exam or, or you know somebody going to write these papers, then what's going to be happening is that uh, you need to make sure that that person gets this video, watch this video in over and over again and get a principle in that case. So that is it about that. Thank you very much for joining the stream. It's always a pleasure coming your way and assisting you to prepare well for the exam. I'll catch you same time tomorrow on uh, the discussion as we continue in that particular case. Note that for those of you writing public sector accounting and finance, we still have some copies of our public sector accounting and finance book. You can get it at 120 
uh, Ghana cities. Then for those of you writing principles of taxation and advanced taxation, you can also get copies of our taxation book. And uh, you call the number scrolling below the screen, 050-114-9296, and we'll be able to deliver uh, wherever you are at after you make your payment in that case. So that's it about that. Thank you for joining us, and I'll catch you same time tomorrow. Remember to follow me on Instagram because the meeting details will be posted on my Instagram page. I also share some content on Instagram strictly that are not on YouTube or on Facebook. So make sure you follow me on Instagram if you're on Instagram and let's get stalking as well there. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.